My work involves using a brain scanner, the one you can see here, to measure people's mental workload while they perform various tasks. So this means that we can tell when software sucks as well as when we made it better. Humans have limited resources, like a computer processors if you want. So let's draw a good line here and people can allocate less or more resources to the task in hand. There's two interesting points here. One is close to the maximum resources and one is close to when we don't allocate enough resources or we're doing something uh, repetitive over a period of time. The best example I can think about is an air traffic controller. He's working very intense for long periods of times. Therefore, as soon as he's reaching a close point next to the maximum resources he has, he might be prone to mistakes. On the other hand, train drivers do a repetitive task, maybe driving hours waiting for the next train station. Therefore, they are very close to boredom. Obviously, the air traffic controller is doing lots of mental processing, keeping planes in the air or landing planes, and that, and that space there is being taken up underneath the graph. And then the available resources for, I don't know, responding to people talking to him and things are getting less and less and less. That's right, and it's always good to have a balance. So don't work too hard, don't work too little. I saw a video recently, and I'm going a bit off topic, of a racing driver driving along and then trying to do some text messages and crashing the car. Exactly, so thinking about, I don't know, designing a sat-nav uh, that is dedicated to a driver, you need to think about that the driver is already doing a task. What we can do with this technique is to measure where on the graph the user is. We kind of want to find out more about the user during interaction and, and we had a couple of experiments where we actually used it in, I don't know, for measuring usability of, of a new system or comparing two, two versions of a website and the layout and, and see what impact has on, on, on a user's brain. But what we are looking to create here is a system to tell users their mental workload in real time. So kind of alerting you, for instance, if you're reaching the, the high workload level we were talking about before. So maybe on the graph. So maybe you can reallocate your resources, take a break, ask for help. We're trying to measure this effect that it might have on you. As well as if you're not working very hard, then we're trying to communicate this to you maybe don't so you're not getting bored and maybe doing something else so so both ends of that graph are a problem both ends are a problem yeah. and keeping the right balance would be ideal um, and now we should invite Max, I think. We're joined by uh, Max from our wonderful uh, search engine videos <laughs> who is involved in this project as well. So tell me what you're going to do then. What we're going to do is connect his brain activity data in real time to the machine on the right. This machine is going to classify the workload in real time. It's going to sense when Max is reaching a high workload or a work low workload. And then we're going to communicate the workload. We're going to give Max some feedback using the lamps. So when the workload increases to a high point, the lights will become red. Depending on what Max is doing, he's getting busier and busier. Or if he's getting towards relax or boredom, they're going to change back to white. So we can kind of monitor Max as well as give him feedback during his uh, interaction with the computer. Now I'm going to ask Max to play a game, an air traffic controller game. The game is called Airport Madness 4 and your job as a player is to play the role of an air traffic controller, manage uh, the landings and departure of planes. We're ready, we can see Max's uh, brain activity increasing and decreasing. This is his forehead, or what's happening behind his forehead, and the red dots here mean increased activity. So if we ask Max to pause and calm down and relax, you can see that it kind of goes away or something happens. So now if we start again the experiment, I can connect it to the um, lights. And what do those lines all mean that you're looking at there then? This is the raw signal. This is um, normally uh, this technology measures how um, much oxygen you have behind your forehead, how much oxygenated the blood behind your forehead is. However, this is just the raw, the raw signals, and you control the intensities of each light depending on the skin color 
of the participant. You need to have the right level so it reaches the right depth in your, in your brain. We're taking a baseline now. That means we're asking Max to relax while we take an average of his brain activity. Right now we connected the lights. That means we can control them from this machine. They will change color when Max is getting very, very busy or his brain becomes really, really active. So now, can you start playing the game, please? Okay. So Max already feels that he made a mistake and something is getting stressed, stressed and more stressed and more stressed because it's getting busier and busier. So if I ask Max some questions now, it's going to make it even worse. Hello. Can you remind me what Pythagoras theorem is? Um, it's to do with triangles. <laughs> the lights are about five seconds behind what um, Max is going through. This much it takes from the heart to pump up the blood to the brain and observe the change. So let's say Max is getting busy five seconds ago, the lights will turn on red now. Hello. <laughs> His phone's going as well. It's for the wife. <laughs> The thing is, they, they were already red. They've gone white since you picked the phone up. <laughs> now try to go back to your task, Max. Hello, he's back, he's back on the air traffic controller job. He's managing his own uh, workload, apparently. No. <laughs> so now what you have to do is to control the other aircraft that come from the left side, because you became better at the task. They give you more, more work to do, like, oh, like in real life jobs. So now you need to control the aircraft on the small terminal. I'm trying to make Max um, distracted from the task a little bit. I'm trying to distract him. So his deoxygenation values reach minus five, which is just crazy. Are you trying to relax now? Okay. Do that. Let it, let it go. <laughs> Let it go. Can you pause? You cannot <laughs> relax. <laughs> you cannot relax until you pause the game. Is this typical then? Typical behavior? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't. Because your mind still stays in the game. He, you can see he's trying to, to stay calm, but as soon as he can see a plane approaching a crash, he's going back in the game. Thanks, Max, for your time. I'm going to just <laughs> take it off you now. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Have fun. What exactly do you take away from an experiment like that? Well, analyzing uh, brain data is not an easy step. It involves um, a lot of signal processing. We need to clear up the movement artifacts that uh, Max potentially did, transforming the raw data into meaningful oxygenation information uh, and brain activity information. Um, and you can have a look at the screen. This is the data after it's been cleared from any kind of movement artifacts. And you can see that there is some interesting moments the signal going up and down. But you can also have a more understandable, if you want, picture at the brain and see which parts were active during which events. Uh, using markers, we track interesting events or um, with the limit between conditions. And then having something like a visual picture of the brain can give us some meaningful information. So the next step could be moving towards uh, more wearable, user-friendly devices. We're, tra we're trying to use uh, things like smartwatches, uh, like this bit of kit, to understand whether we need or we don't need the brain scanner, really. Uh, we want something that people can wear, and if we can infer brain activity from something like this, then we might just give up the brain scanner because everybody's using a smartwatch these days and Fitbits and other some sort of equipment. So what we want is a measure that will say this result set is better than that result set. And so for this what we use is an average precision score. So you have to do a lot of matrix solving to work that one out. And that's the difference in the problem that gets given to us.